Are you a peacemaker or a drama seeker? He doesn't say like peace is just going to passively happen in your life. Like you're accidentally going to stumble upon peace. No, but go chase after peace. Go pursue it with all of your heart. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching today. Many of you guys know that in March, my grandmother passed away and I went to India for her funeral. Well, the whole time I was there, I was reminded of the scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2 that says, better to go to a funeral than to a party. Now, who wouldn't want to go to a party or a celebration? Like, I would much rather prefer that than to be grieving and mourning at a funeral. But as I was there, I was reminded just how much we can learn from going to a funeral. Because oftentimes, like, funerals help us to refocus on the things that are important. We get distracted and we start pursuing things that don't matter. And sometimes we might live like we are invincible, just cruising through life, doing whatever you want to do, pursuing whatever you want to pursue, until we are faced with the reality of death and we are reminded that we need to examine like what is truly important, what really matters in life. When I was looking at my grandmother's casket, there was nothing in there, just her body, no material possessions. In the end, we're not gonna take anything with us, but when I get to the end, I wanna make sure that I am living in peace with everyone. I don't wanna take strife to the grave. I don't wanna take unresolved conflict and unforgiveness to the grave. I hear so many people say, man, I wish I could have one more hour or another day with my mom or my brother or uh, my grandmother, whoever's hurt you, so that I can ask them for forgiveness, so that I can extend forgiveness. But now it's too late for me to do that. So don't wait until it's too late because tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. Instead, why don't you start making steps towards peace today? I love Psalm 34, 14. It says, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The reason I love this verse so much is because David uses like active words. Seek peace. Like when you seek something, you like go looking for it. I think of like kids playing hide and go seek. Like they don't stop until they find that person, right? And sometimes it's hidden in the most obscure places and it takes a while. It's like, go looking for it. Be intentional about seeking peace and don't give up until you find it. He doesn't say like peace is just going to passively happen in your life, that you're just going to passively receive peace. He doesn't say like you're accidentally going to stumble upon peace. No, we are called to actively look for peace. Now, when I think about the word pursue, I think about the Discovery Channel. When a lion is hiding, waiting for its prey, and it sees its prey, it sees that antelope in the distance, and it pursues and chases after it. Now, that might not be the best imagery because I hope you don't devour your enemies or devour the people that hurt you, but instead, like, like go chase after peace. Go pursue it with all of your heart. Do everything in your power to maintain peace, to be a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Like if there's anything in my life, any conflict, unresolved issues, and I am not actively trying to bring restoration to those relationships, I'm not actively doing something in order to, to maintain the peace, then I'm not living out the word of God because it says, Seek peace and pursue it. Do your part. Don't wait for somebody else to do the seeking and to do the pursuit, but instead, we are the ones that need to be active. So practically speaking, how do we chase peace? How do we pursue it? And I believe the secret and the key lies in Luke chapter six, which talks all about loving your enemies. It says, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. So I wanna start with the first thing, how to chase peace. The first thing is to pray. Pray for the situation and all the people that are involved. I think oftentimes, like if somebody has hurt me, my immediate response is to distance myself from them, to 
um, isolate myself, never to speak about, like just to forget about them and cut them out of my life. But when I do that, then peace and restoration is not possible. And that's what scripture says. The ultimate goal is to seek peace with everyone. So when I cut them out of my life, then it's not possible. Maybe you're at a place where someone has deeply hurt you and you are scarred by what they've done to you. If I don't have the courage to go and talk to that person and to make things right, well, talk to God about it. I might not have the courage to talk to them, but I can talk to God about them. I can pray for them to write their names down in my journal and pray for them consistently. And guys, you will be amazed at how often the Lord will go before you and work in your heart and also the heart of the other person. Now, even if you don't see anything happening in the situation, God is working on your heart. God is making your heart softer towards that person and he's building up courage in you so that you can eventually talk to them. Or maybe he's doing the same thing in the other person as well. And perhaps even in prayer, we become more aware of our faults and the areas that we need to apologize in. So prayer is powerful. Prayer can do miracles even before you do anything. Go and pray and seek the Lord and he will go before you and start working in both hearts. There's a testimony I love by Joyce Meyer. She talks about how she was abused by her father growing up and how for the longest time she didn't want anything to do with her parents because her mom never actually stood up for her and her dad was the abuser. But years later down the road, She came to a place in her life where she extended forgiveness and even bought her parents a home. And I think like when you pray for people, the Lord begins to chip away at that hatred, that anger, and he begins to do a work in your heart and also in the heart of the other person. Later on, before her dad passed away, he became a believer. And I believe that is a result of prayer because prayer can work miracles. The second thing is bless those who curse you. Have you ever been cursed at before? Well, if you have, then immediately your defenses go up, right? Like you wanna fight back. You want to get even with that person and you wanna protect yourself, your identity and your reputation. But what scripture says is in those situations, bless them. Do the opposite of what you are feeling. Now, blessing is all about the words that you speak about other people. Don't use your words to put people down, to speak negatively, even if that person has mistreated you. Don't gossip about them. I love something that Jackie Hill Perry says. She says, don't gossip to others, gossip to God. Tell God what they've done. Tell God how they've mistreated you instead of telling a bunch of other people. Now, it's okay to confide in a few people, a few close friends or family members, but if you try to smear that person's reputation and if you try to speak negatively about them to everyone, then your heart and your motive is not in the right place. Bless. Blessings are all about words. Now, you might feel like, I don't have anything positive to say about this person and I don't want to. Well, in that case, don't say anything at all. Or maybe you can start with privately blessing them. If you can't publicly say positive things about them, privately in your prayer life, talk to God about them, bless them in the presence of God. Start with that. There's someone I know whose wife was unfaithful and she eventually divorced him. And he says he never speaks about his ex-wife in a belittling way or in a negative way in front of his children or in front of other people. Why? Because his ex-wife is the mother of his children and he doesn't want to taint their perspective of her in front of them. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, that, that's pretty neat because I know some of his story and I know the things that he has gone through and he's experienced 
and he could have a laundry list of bad things to say about his ex-wife, but he chooses not to. Like, he could say all these things so that his children would side with him and would favor him over her in, in order to make her look terrible, but he doesn't because he wants to set an example for his children that it's important to maintain peace. Anytime you speak negatively about someone, it creates a rift and the division becomes larger and larger and larger, bigger and bigger until the relationship is so severed that it cannot be put back together. Our words have that kind of power. We can either choose to bless or to curse. Bless your enemies because that's what scripture says. And in the long run, you can live a life of peace and without guilt, knowing that you used your way, your words in a way to build and uplift people, not to tear them down. So we've talked about prayer. That was the first one. It starts with prayer. Then it goes on to using our words to bless people. And it doesn't stop there. Now we talk about actions. Do good to those who hate you. And this is the third and final way. Do good to those who hate you. Naturally, when we have been hurt or when we have enemies, we want to get revenge. We want to get even with them. But scripture says, no, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance creates a destructive and unending cycle. But instead, we are called to do good. And what does that look like practically? One, maybe you should be the first one to apologize. When Jesus was on the cross and he died for our sins, he says, Father, forgive them. Like, he wasn't the one that hurt us. We were the ones that hurt him. But he, on our behalf, asks for forgiveness. And he for and he forgives us. Like, he goes first in forgiveness. So following the example of Christ, why not apologize? Why not ask for forgiveness? Even if it's a situation where you're the person that has been wronged. The second one is to be honest with the people who have hurt you. Oftentimes, we might carry around offense in our hearts or bitterness against someone because of what they did and that person might be oblivious to it, may not even know that they did that. And we're carrying around this hatred and anger thinking that person intentionally hurt us. So why not be honest with that person and say, hey, I've been carrying this in my heart against you for a while and I want to free myself of this. I want you to know that this is how I've been hurt and maybe you don't know that you've done this to me, but I just want to release this and, and I want to ask you for forgiveness because I may have mistreated you because of my anger and because of my bitterness. And finally, do good. I want to give you guys an example. Now, there was a coworker who I didn't necessarily have a pleasant relationship with and her birthday was coming up. I knew that. So I decided to get her a gift. And you know what? I was reading actually in Proverbs. I want to open this up because it is so important. And this verse might actually change your life, guys. Okay. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 6. It says, everyone is the friend of a person who gives gifts. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to give her a gift. I don't really get along with her very well. But let me make my offering of peace. And... Ever since I did that, our relationship has been so much more cordial. She began to see that I was not her enemy, that I was actually willing to have a good and decent relationship with her. So giving a gift can be the way to show someone that you are actively pursuing peace, that you want to do good. It might look different in your, in your own life, but ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how can I do something good for someone who has hurt me, who has mistreated me, who may, who I may even say is my enemy? A little bit more about peace, okay? Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the armor of God, and we are told to put on the shoes of peace 
Once again, it's active. It's walking in peace. Are you a peacemaker or a drama seeker? Guys, let me tell you something. There are so many shows on TV right now that are all about conflict and drama. People living together in a big home and they have a ton of issues. They have a lot of um, interpersonal conflicts. And that is entertaining for us nowadays. Like if there is no drama in a show, then it's not fun, it's not entertaining. And that is what the world values. But imagine a show where everybody lived in peace. would be like, oh my gosh, that's not, that's boring. That's not bringing in any revenue. Nobody wants to see that. People for some reason are entertained by drama. But scripture says, walk in peace in your relationships. If you're constantly involved in drama and you've had issues with people repeatedly over and over and over again, then I would say check yourself because you are the common denominator in all of these relationships. And it's easy to blame the other person and say, oh, they're at fault. They, their personality is, is like this and they constantly get into arguments, but once again, look within, check yourself. Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, you're going to get the same results. And perhaps, whether it's unintentional and you don't even know that you're doing this, perhaps you are creating drama that you are unaware of. So let the Holy Spirit work in your own life and change your own heart rather than trying to blame other people and actively seek peace. Pursue after it. Be a peacemaker. I want to close with this one last final thought, guys. This is so interesting. We have a small group that my husband and I do meets in our apartment once a week with some couples. And we're going through the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 4, in Philippians chapter 4, um, Paul writes, now I, now I appeal to you, Odia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. In another translation in the NA, NASB, it says, live in harmony in the Lord. In the ESV, it says, agree in the Lord. What's interesting about this is, this is a letter that was written to the church of Philippi and it was most likely read publicly to the congregation. And Paul is calling out two women who are having a disagreement. He's calling them out publicly. Please settle your disagreement. I don't know what exactly they were arguing about, but it was obviously causing so much disruption in, in the church. It was obviously causing disunity. So Paul publicly rebukes them and says, guys, get it together. Agree. You might not agree in politics. You might not agree in um, culture. You might not agree on certain things. But he says, agree in the Lord. You see, the gospel gives us something to agree on that's bigger than our disagreements. When you are a follower of Jesus and the person sitting across from you or the person that has a disagreement with you is also a follower of Jesus, you both can agree in the Lord in spite of everything. It seems like unity is so important for Paul that he would risk humiliating someone, humiliating two people, for the sake of unity in the church. Like he is going to the extent of publicly correcting them. That is how serious he is about peace and pursuing peace. Now I want to read a little bit more, okay? It says in verse Philippians 4, verse 3, And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. These two women have done some incredible things for the kingdom. They have shared the gospel. They probably even um, led people to salvation. And Paul's saying, don't let all of your ministry efforts go to waste. This disagreement 
is ruining your testimony, okay? Guys, disunity spreads like wildfire and can tear churches apart, can tear families apart, and can turn people's hearts away from God. It can actually undo the ministry that we have done, unraveling all of the ministry success that you had. Guys, unity, maintaining the peace is just as important as ministry, as your ministry. I think of Matthew chapter 5. Um, let's turn to it. Matthew chapter 5, 23. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to the Lord. So if, if like you are worshiping the Lord, you're doing ministry, you're presenting an offering and, and you are reminded and you know that there is a disagreement, there is disunity, there is division with you and someone else, then first go make that right because that is important. Before you come and bring your offering to the Lord, before you do any ministry, go and make things right with that person first, then come back and present your offering to the Lord. You know what that shows me? That God really values our the condition of our heart. God really values harmony and peace. That if we have division within our hearts or wrong motives, that we should first make things right before we present a sacrifice or offering or do any kind of ministry for the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Like that would really shift your perspective. What if that becomes the goal first? And you might need to ask an elder. You might need to ask... Um, um, a leader in the church for help in order to bring restoration to this relationship. It says here, like, I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women. Like, help them. They might need some help in order to gain peace. And it's okay to ask for help if you need that. I want to add one more thing. What if you've done all that you can do and peace is not possible because the other person isn't cooperating? Well, you've done your part and God is only going to hold you accountable for that. But continue to pray for them in the situation and maybe that's all you can do for now. So ultimately, I just want to leave you with this final thing. Seek peace and pursue it. Chase after it. Let that be the goal of your life. Pray for those who hate you and mistreat you. Bless them with your words and finally do good. Let it be evident in your actions. I hope that this was a really like helpful and eye-opening message for you. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch this.